every once in a while, you come across one of those passages that makes you kind of just, you know, squint your eyes, shake your head, scratch your head maybe, and just go, I, I, don't, I don't know if I totally know what to do with that. <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure if I've uh, heard a sermon on this or even know what box to put it in. That was one of those moments that I had this morning when I was reading Exodus chapter 34. See, in Exodus chapter 34, this is, this is after Moses came down from the mountain the first time and was so upset, he shattered the tablets that the Lord had given him, uh, which at the beginning of chapter 34, the Lord brings back up. So Moses is, is back up on the Mount Sinai. He's engaging the Lord in a way in which no other human has. And it says, the Lord said to Moses, first one, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, on the first tablets, which you broke. I love that. <laughs> you know, the ones that you shattered. And then he says, be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. This isn't more of a prohibition as it is a fatherly protection. The Lord knows that whenever the amount of presence that he will be gracing this mountain with is so power, so powerful, so palpable that uncleanness would be completely obliterated by it. I mean, it's going to be so intense that even down in verses 29 and following, Moses' face will be radiating after he's off the mountain to the point where he has to wear a veil to protect the other people because it hurt to even view Moses after he had experienced this incredible, powerful interaction with the Lord. So it's, a, it's an act of grace. Verse 4 comes then, it says, So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and he went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud, what a cool moment, and stood there with him. It reminds me of Eden, where the Lord is walking in the cool of the morning with Adam. He, he stands there with Moses. He stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. I love how the Lord introduces himself here. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. What a way to begin a description of yourself. Abounding in love, slow to anger, gracious, compassionate, faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And then there comes this very weird part of the passage. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is what's referred to as the generational curse. And it's one of those passages that makes me kind of shake my head. <laughs> Where I'm like, what? If you're slow to anger, if you're abounding in love and compassionate, then what are you going after the children for? It's the parents' sin. The parents are the one that did it. This is going to sound strange, but it reminded me of a passage in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 29. This is, a, this is in the midst of a bunch of um, instructions for Christian living. Almost kind of like Sinai-type laws of the way to move closer to the Lord that is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. And in verse 29, it says something very fascinating. It says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. The Greek word there for unwholesome means something like corrupt or, or um, um, rotten. Do not let any rotten, unwholesome, corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
And then notice how the way in which you're using your tongue leads right into the discussion in verse 30 of, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. What is interesting is that that description of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, every form of malice sounds almost like the complete opposite of how God introduces himself in Exodus chapter 34. Compassionate, loving, forgiving of the rebellion and the wicked. Here's what I find interesting, though. What begins this whole litany of things not to do in Ephesians 4 is this simple, simple phrase. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Let let me get more to the heart of what Paul's saying here, though. Get rid of all kinds of those types of words and thinking, because what flows out of the mouth we know also comes from the heart. And here's the first place to practice abandoning unwholesome talk. How you speak about yourself. How you speak to yourself. Here's one of the things I found very fascinating when it comes to children. We assume that these curses on the other generations have to be these elaborate, spoken, almost like um, magical incantations. These curses that we have to try to find a way to break. But oftentimes we don't understand that what unwholesome talk is, is a curse. It's even one of the reasons why we talk about the, the fear of damning someone. We even have a curse word where, you know, you say the Lord's name in vain and then you use the word for damn. Why? Because the way that we speak about others or to ourselves is a way of engaging in curses. One of the things I found with children is that regardless if they are biological children or adopted children, children don't know DNA, but they do know the language of love. And whenever you speak curses over that which they love, even yourself, Shane, you moron. Shane, you're such an idiot. Don't be surprised when the child experiences the same curses in their own lives. For how you treat and speak about yourself will be transferred to the mouths of your children. And let me tell you this, that pattern is not easy to break. It will go on for generations and generations and generations. What I'm arguing is this. A generational curse has a lot to do with how you speak to others and to yourself. And instead of justifying it because we did something dumb or because we think that we are foolish, instead, I want you to embrace how the Lord identified himself in Exodus 34. Whether you are speaking to others or to yourself, always speak in a manner that gives dignity, that gives love, that gives honor, that gives grace to yourself and to the people around you. And when you do, don't be surprised when your children and your children's children speak with the same grammar. My challenge for you this week is to speak to others, but more importantly, to speak to yourself in the same way that the Lord speaks about himself. Someone who is loving, compassionate, gracious, and in pursuit of the broken people, both inside and outside of us. I love you guys. Have a good week.